In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him and apart from him nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. Verse nine, there was the true light which coming into the world enlightens every man. He was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. He came to his own and those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. You can be seated. Christianity is the most persecuted religion in the history of the world. Now there are other religions, of course, that are persecuted. Every country in the world has its own ethnic and religious divisions and battles take place. What makes Christianity unique is that the persecution of Christians is ubiquitous. In every nation where you find Christians, you find persecution. With other religions, there are safe havens, there's countries with the, the flags that defend them, uh, but not so with, with Christianity. You look, even, look even at the history of Judaism and you see that Jews have, have often been persecuted, especially in recent history, and yet it's very difficult, if not impossible, to distinguish between being persecuted for their religion and their ethnicity. Christianity is different even from that. Christianity is designed to transcend ethnicities. It's designed to transcend ethnic boundaries. It's designed to transcend national boundaries, language boundaries. It's designed to be global and yet at the same time to be narrow. This is exactly why Christians are always persecuted. By its very design, Christians don't have a nation. They don't have a culture in that sense. They are always opposed to the culture. They never embrace it. They're always opposed to the world. They're never of it. They're always opposed to the world system. They're never part of it. Another way of saying it, Christians are always on the narrow path, not the wide. It's always the narrow gate. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. There are few who find it. Narrow is the way that leads to Broad is the way that leads to destruction and many are on it. Narrow is the way that leads to salvation and there are few who find it. Because Christians are the voice against the culture, the voice against the world, the voice against world systems, they are always opposed by those very things. And this shouldn't surprise us. This is the kind of reception that Jesus had. He came into the world as the light of the world, but the darkness did not understand the light. Verse five said, later on in John chapter three, John's gonna tell us that the light was hated by the darkness. The reason darkness didn't understand the light is because it hates it. Light comes in and exposes sin. Darkness loves sin and wants the light to go away. Because Jesus came and was constantly persecuted, he tells us that you can't expect to be treated differently than that. A student is not above his master, is he? So how would you expect to be treated as greater than Jesus? If they compared him to the devil, certainly they'll compare you likewise. With that said, the entire life of Jesus should be seen through the lens of persecution. When you look at the person and work of Christ, when you look at the things he did and what he taught, his actions and his attributes, you should study all of them through the lens of persecution. When you read about Jesus, read it through persecution goggles. <laughs> read about his life through the filter that he is being persecuted. And listen, this is the key phrase. This was God's will for him. It was God's will that he would be persecuted. My goal this morning is for you to see the intersection of persecution and salvation. I want you to see how persecution and salvation are never opposed. They're not even parallel. They're constantly intersecting. God's design was for Jesus to be persecuted and that persecution intersects with salvation. This is the path that's marked throughout all of scripture, the, the pathway for God's people, the narrow path for God's people from the Garden of Eden all the way till now, all the way into his kingdom is always a pathway marked by both salvation and persecution and they constantly intersect. I'm gonna let you know my secret agenda this morning. I was gonna keep it secret, but I'll, I'll let you know just real quick. It's my goal this morning to convince you that persecution is not inherently negative. 
Now, when you think of persecution, you should not instinctively think of something negative. Clearly, persecuting believers is sinful. It's the devil who instigates persecution of believers, and God will judge those who persecute his children. Paul tells the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 1 that he's gonna avenge them with flaming arrows of judgment. Nevertheless, it is also God's will for his church and his people and his son to be persecuted. It is part and parcel with the gospel. The road to salvation goes through persecution and it's not because the map maker got lost. God designed this to be the road we walk. This is what we see here in John chapter one, verse 11. He came to his own. Jesus came to his own and his own did not receive him. This was not an accident, this was God's design. You understand this when you go back to chapter one, verse one. The first three verses of John chapter one describe that the word of God is Jesus Christ. He is God himself, that Jesus is the logos, he's the the word, the logic, the, the very God himself becomes a man. Not only is he God in human flesh, verses one through three, he's the creator of all things, but verse four, he's the life. That all who have life have life because he gives it to them. This is true of believers and non-believers alike. Anything with breath has breath by the sovereign will of the living God. He lends us his breath. Even those who don't acknowledge him or don't bow their knee still draw their breath from the sovereign pleasure of God. Not only is he the creator and is he the word and is he the life, but he's also the light of all men, it says in verse four. He's the light into the world. That means that the light shows God's standard. The light is God's revelation. That's the way the Old Testament uses the phrase. The light that shines into the world is his revelation. It's our consciences that convict us of our sin. It's the word of God given to show us how we ought to live. This is the light of the world. That light is manifest in Jesus Christ. Even in the Old Testament, the darkness, verse five is gonna say, hates the light. The light shines into the darkness and darkness hates it. The light comes into the world, even all the way back in the Garden of Eden, and darkness flees from the light. You see this with Cain and Abel, when they, uh, when they had sin, they were supposed to offer for sacrifices for their sin. Cain murdered Abel, and John says in 1 John that Cain murdered Abel because Abel's deeds were righteous and Cain's were wicked. Cain didn't murder murder Abel out of some kind of sibling rivalry. Cain murdered Abel because Cain hated the light. And Abel's life was a testimony to the truth of the light. You see this even with Adam and Eve. Once they sinned, they hid from God. But you see it brought into flesh, brought into blood with Cain murdering Abel. And it goes forward from there. Through all of history, those who have the word of God, who love God, are hated by those who don't. Because every ray of light into the world exposes the sin that's in people's hearts. In the New Testament, Jesus comes in the world. He's hated by the world. John says in John chapter three, the light comes into the darkness. The darkness would not come to the light for fear that their evil deeds would be exposed. He goes beyond that even to say that the darkness hates the light. Darkness does not want to be exposed for being evil, for believing a lie, This is God's design. It means that the truth of the gospel is is more evident in a world that rejects it, that Jesus came to the world and his own did not receive him. They would persecute him instead. Who persecutes him? Well, his, his own. Notice how the first the chapter begins with describing everybody in the world. Everybody with life belongs to him and he came to those people. In other words, he came to, to people With breath, he came to living people and they would not receive him. Then verse 11 gets a little bit smaller. He came to his own people in contrast with verse 10, the whole world. Verse 11 is his own people, the Jews, the descendants of Abraham, and they didn't receive him. It's not just that the world rejected him, it's that Jews rejected him. And then verse 12 gets even more specific. He came to his own elect, his own children who would believe in him, and they did not receive him. He came to the world, rejected. He came to the Jews, rejected. He came to his own, rejected. Nevertheless, he will overcome that rejection and bring salvation, verses 12 and 13 describe. I hope to convince you through this passage that persecution and salvation are inseparable. They cross, and there's three obvious ways they cross from this passage. First, persecution is central to Jesus' life. 
Persecution was central to Jesus' life. He was born into a long line of persecuted people. His whole life was marked by persecution from even before he was born. John the Baptist was to prepare the way for him. John the Baptist was persecuted. We know how that, well that went, don't we? He spoke out against the sexual ethic and the sexual immorality of his day and they cut his head off. He was the one preparing the way for Jesus. Jesus did not fare much better, of course. From the moment of his birth, he was persecuted by the world. The leaders of the world uh, came around him, the government leaders in the area, and wanted to kill him. They did a holocaust. They wiped out all the infants in the whole area to target him. They would rather slaughter all the infants than let him live. That was the world in which he was born. Persecuted before he could speak. Persecuted before he could walk. Even at his birth, he was hunted. His childhood was marked by persecution. He had to flee to Egypt where he lived for a while. This is paralleled in the Old Testament with Israel, wasn't it? Israel was persecuted. They had to to flee to Egypt. They were decimated at the end of Jeremiah and fled to Egypt so the scripture could call Israel back out of Egypt to reestablish them in the promised land. This is the same path that Jesus would walk. It's a path that was marked by persecution in the Old Testament. Persecuted at birth, fleeing to Egypt. Out of Egypt, God calls his son, returning back to the land where he'll be persecuted again. Luke chapter four records his first sermon in his ministry. The result of that sermon, the people grabbed him and wanted to throw him off a cliff to kill him. And it went downhill from there. His first act in his public ministry, John chapter two says, was cleansing the temple. He goes to the temple and turns over the table, drives out the money changers, and they determined at that moment that they were going to kill him. The religious leaders of the day, those that oversaw God's temple were gonna put him to death. He was persecuted for his miracles. He healed the man with the withered hand on the Sabbath and the disciples decided, or the Pharisees decided he must die for that. His disciples rolled grain in their hand on the Sabbath and the Pharisees decided he must die for this. He can't be allowed to disregard the traditions of men. And Jesus even rhetorically asked them, for which of my good deeds are you gonna put me to death for? Of course, they weren't gonna put him to death for any of his good deeds. They were gonna put him to death because they hated him. The darkness hates the light. He was persecuted for his miracles. He was persecuted for his healing. He was persecuted because the world hated him. He was persecuted for his teaching. He spoke the truth and whenever he spoke the truth, the lies that were believed in the hearts of people were exposed and people couldn't tolerate that. Every word that Jesus spoke exposed people for being hypocrites, for believing lies, for loving sin. And obviously he was persecuted at his arrest, his trial, his sham trial, his so-called conviction, and obviously his execution. This was the path of his life. He came to his own. His own didn't receive him from day one forward throughout his life. And as I said, this is the path that was prepared for him. This shouldn't surprise us because we're familiar with the history of Israel. Jesus was persecuted in the same way that Israel was persecuted. This is the experience of Israel in the Old Testament. Israel was made by God for the purpose of being persecuted. They were supposed to be different. They were supposed to expose the immorality to the nations of the world. Thus Israel was rejected and persecuted from day one. God called Abram and he was in opposition to Sodom and Gomorrah that were judged and he was different. He was led to to Egypt. There's 400 years between the end of Genesis and the start of the book of Exodus. There's a gap in time, but not a gap in theme. When you start the book of Exodus, you shouldn't be surprised that Israel's persecuted there. The descendants of Abraham don't fit in in Egypt. They don't worship the Egyptian gods. They don't live like the Egyptians. They stand out. And so they're persecuted. Pharaoh wants to wipe them out. They flee in their flight through the, the wilderness. God tells them, Deuteronomy chapter four, that they are supposed to be a light to the world. That's got not good news for them. Light shines in the darkness, but the darkness hates the light. And so the nations of the world are gonna be opposed to Israel. They're gonna rally around them. They're gonna try to squash them out. And this becomes the history of Israel, one of persecution from the surrounding nations because they don't worship the nation's gods. In fact, in the Old Testament, the only respite that Israel gets from persecution is when they compromise and do worship the other nation's gods. That's the path of least resistance and the path they walk on, but whenever they veer from it, they receive persecution. Finally, they're obliterated, abolished from the land, exiled by God himself, sent to Egypt. They come back to Egypt, 70 years later, they're persecuted again. This is the days of Nehemiah. 
where even the religious leaders inside of Israel were persecuting the, the Jews. The other nations were most certainly persecuting. This is the days of Esther, where Haman wants to wipe out the Jews. That's the story of Israel. Persecution after persecution because they were designed to be God's light to the world. But not only is Jesus gonna be persecuted like Israel was persecuted, he's gonna be persecuted like the Old Testament prophets were persecuted. They had this double persecution those prophets did. They were persecuted by the nations because they were Israelite, but they were also persecuted by the Israelites for being God's word of condemnation to them. Israel compromised and worshiped the pagan God, so God sent them prophets to expose their compromise, confront their sin, call them to repentance, and those prophets did just that, and the prophets were always put to death by the Jews. This is why Jesus rhetorically asks, the disciples, and they're panicking about his, his death. Remember, he's gonna walk from the Mount of Transfiguration down to Jerusalem, and the disciples say, yeah, I guess we'll go be put to death too, along with you. And Jesus pretty much tells them, calm down. He says, it's impossible for any prophet to die outside of Jerusalem. All the prophets will die in Jerusalem. You don't need to worry until we get there. He then asks them, confronting the religious leaders, are there any prophets that your ancestors didn't kill? Are there any prophets that weren't put to death by the Jewish leaders? Abel to Zechariah, Jesus says, A to Z. Abel being killed by his brother Cain, and notice how when Jesus says that, he connects Cain to the Jewish religious leaders and Abel to the prophets and sent and to himself. All the way to Zechariah, the last prophet in the Old Testament who was killed. Remember, he was killed clinging to the horns of the, the altar. He was killed in the, the Holy of Holies. They struck him down there. This is the legacy of the prophets. They spoke the light to the dark nation of Israel and the Israelite leaders killed them. So that's why when John 1 verse 11 says he came to his own, his own didn't receive him, you shouldn't be surprised. Jesus came to his own and he'll be treated just like the prophets were. The result, it's impossible to separate Jesus' sufferings from the concept of persecution. God sent Jesus into the world to his own people knowing that he would be persecuted. This was God's plan. They're one and the same. Jesus had a mission from God and that mission was to come to earth and be persecuted by his people. The world would persecute him. The Jews would persecute him. Even the elect would persecute him. He had a mission from God and that mission was persecuted. That's why I say his entire life should be viewed through the lens of persecution. That's why John begins his gospel with this. You read everything that Jesus did, you read it through the lens of suffering at the hands of others by the will of God. God sent him for this reason. And persecution is the right word. He wasn't opposed for his, for anything other than his, the, fa the fact that he had truth. He had authority, he had religious truth. And that's why he was rejected. At the end of the day, he was rejected and killed for speaking truth to people. He could raise the dead. They hated him for that, exposed them as liars. Lazarus, I mean, the scripture says that the Jews hated Lazarus because Jesus rose him back from the dead. I mean, Lazarus was a walking Ebenezer of the, of the fact that Jesus had the power over death. And they couldn't tolerate that. Even when he was arrested by Pilate, Pilate confronts him and Jesus says that he speaks the truth and Pilate just shrugs his shoulders. What is truth then? Remember what Jesus told Pilate? You would have no authority if it were not given to you from my father. What did Pilate do with that authority? Murder Jesus. That lets you know two things, that Jesus was killed for speaking the truth and for having authority, but secondly, that it was under God's authority that Jesus was crucified. It was the will of God to strike his son. This was God's plan that he would be persecuted. Jesus told the crowd that Abraham would have worshiped him. The crowd turned around to kill him instead. That's John chapter eight. Everywhere Jesus went, he spoke this. He said, I speak the truth. If you knew God, you would know my voice, John chapter 10. If you knew the voice of God, you'd know my voice. John chapter 14, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, Jesus says. This is why he's persecuted, for being the one with life, with truth, and with authority. And this leads him all the way to the cross, which leads to our second point. Not only is persecution central to Jesus' life, secondly, persecution is central to the gospel. Persecution is central to the gospel. It was God's design that Jesus would be persecuted and that persecution would result in his death on the cross. 
Look at verse 12, it carries on. As many as who did receive him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or the will of man, but born of God. Those people who did receive him are in contrast to those who were rejecting him. Their reception of Christ, Jesus, John is playing off the word received here. The world didn't receive him, but there are some who did receive him. That contrast is what produces salvation. And this, it says at the end of verse 13, is the will of God. I mean, obviously this is a verse about God's sovereignty over salvation, that's, that's obvious. But get beyond that to the second point. This verse declares that it was God's will that Jesus would be persecuted. Because that's what leads to the gospel. He came to his own, his own received him not, did not receive him. They opposed him, opposed him, cornered him, betrayed him, murdered him on the cross which produces in turn our salvation. God's will is for people to come to faith in spite of persecution. God's will is for Jesus to lead a sinless life and still be martyred on the cross. This is God's will, verse 13 says. And we should be prepared for this, shouldn't we? We understand even from the Old Testament, from the book of Job, that it was God's will for Job to be demonically attacked. It was the devil who did it, thinking he could defeat Lord and the Lord and rob God of his integrity. God permitted it under his sovereignty so that God could be vindicated through Job's affliction. The devil's greatest attack in the Old Testament in that sense turns into God's greatest vindication. That should prepare your mind for what happens with Jesus. That he's opposed, it's demonic to oppose him. It's evil to oppose him. It's sinful to oppose him. And yet he turns the opposition to his own vindication. The night he was betrayed, the devil himself entered Judas. Jesus said, it's the will of God for the son of man to be betrayed, but woe to the person who does it. The devil enters Judas, Judas betrays Jesus, Jesus is crucified, the devil thought he could defeat God's plan by getting Jesus quickly to the cross. What does God do? He takes that gun and turns it against the devil. The cross becomes his biggest victory in all of redemptive history. It was the devil's biggest attack, murdering God in human flesh, and it becomes God's biggest victory. Do you understand how persecution is inextricably linked to the gospel? The cross is persecution, and God was sovereign over it. This is how Peter says it in Acts chapter four, Jesus was betrayed by the hands of sinful men, which God had predestined from before time to happen. It was the sinful men that betrayed the sovereign, sinless son of God. This was all in the plan of God to bring salvation to the world through faith in Christ. This tension shouldn't surprise us. It's always been this way. Sin is always in opposition to God, and yet God always uses it to vindicate himself. It's strangely ironic that persecution is the will of God, yet also the expression of opposition against God. And I wanna say that sentence again because I wanna make sure you hear it. It's strangely ironic that persecution is the will of God, yet also the expression of opposition against God. People persecute the light because they hate the light. But God uses that for the light to shine brighter and you see that with the gospel of Christ. As he was crucified on the cross, he bore our sins. He himself was sinless. He wasn't gonna die on his, his own. The wages of sin is death. He had no sin. How would he die? Well, he would be betrayed and our sin would be placed on him. He would be persecuted all the way to the cross and then he would die in our place. Persecution is at the center of the gospel. Well, not only is persecution at the center of Jesus' life and the center of the gospel, thirdly, persecution is central to evangelism. Evangelism flows from persecution. God advances his gospel through the world through evangelism. And evangelism is fueled by persecution. Listen, you got to church, the vehicle you got to church in this morning was your car, most likely. I know some people lived across the street. I talked to some of them this morning. They drove across the street this morning. It was raining. It's all right, we have a parking lot. Come on over. Your vehicle, your car was the vehicle that got you to church. Of persecution is the vehicle of evangelism. God uses persecution to spread the gospel around the world. It's the means by which God spreads the gospel. 
Persecution is God's chosen means to take the gospel to the nations. I know he chose preaching. Faith comes by hearing and hearing through the words or the speech or the preaching about Christ. But nevertheless, persecution is what fuels the preaching. It's what expands the preaching. It's what takes the preaching global. And you understand this from Romans 10. All those who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved, Paul says. But how can you call on someone whom you don't believe? How can you believe in someone whom you've never heard? And how can you hear unless there's a preacher? This is why the prophet Isaiah says, how beautiful are the feet of them that bear the good news. It is good and beautiful to bring the message of the gospel into the world. And yet those feet are always persecuted, even back in Isaiah's day. They're always persecuted feet. They're beautiful feet and they're persecuted feet. And they're the ones that bring the gospel message. You see this in the book of Acts. In the upper room, the disciples were there. They've heard the Great Commission, what, three or four times by this point? And yet they're still hanging out in Jerusalem. Then by Acts chapter two, into chapter three and four, persecution breaks forth. They were content to stay. They knew the Great Commission, but they were also buying houses in Jerusalem. (laughs) Persecution comes and they get scattered. And God takes the message to the world through their persecution. This doesn't just end with Acts chapter four. It carries on through all of the, the book of Acts. This is the, first, the church's first short-term mission projects were all persecution-driven. <laughs> Paul goes to the city preaching the gospel, gets beat up, thrown out the gate, left to die. He took that as God's will for him to go to the next city. In many ways, Paul was like Jonah. He's arrested for preaching the gospel, put on a boat, shipwrecked. He's got to swim to shore to people that need the gospel. Persecution is what God used to spread Christians out and get the gospel around the world. But it's more than just the motivation behind dispersion. It's more than that. Persecution is often used in your own heart to bring you to faith. You see this with Saul. Saul was the one who was standing up overseeing the martyrdom of Stephen. Acts chapter seven into Acts chapter eight. And God used that to prick his heart and bring him to faith. You know, some of you were born into a Christian family and maybe you've kind of grown up knowing the gospel and of course you were born dead in your sins and trespasses but you believed at a young age and you never remember a time where you were really hostile towards Christians. And if that's your testimony, praise, praise the Lord. I pray that's my children's testimony. But that's not everybody's testimony. Many of you have come to faith later on in life and when you look back perhaps at the way you used to treat, treat Christians, that you did used to mock Christians, you did use to oppose Christians. Maybe you weren't like Saul and oversaw their death or anything, but you were hostile towards them and you did mock them. Do you see how God uses that in your heart when you come to faith? That it pricks your conscience. It makes you broken over your sin. This is 1 Corinthians six eleven. Such were some of you. Some of you were blasphemers. Some of you were sexually immoral. Some of you were idolaters. Some of you were persecutors. Such were some of you, but you've been washed. You've been sanctified by God through faith. You've been justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. 1 Corinthians six eleven. Persecution is what God may be used to bring you to faith. And now God uses that to fuel evangelism. As people bring the gospel message to the world and they're opposed for it, the truth of the message is verified. If you went to the world preaching an easy message, that doesn't cost you anything. The truth isn't verified. If you had the health and wealth gospel, you know, believe and you'll get things, who doesn't want to preach that? You have the opposite of that message, though. We don't have a message, preach and you get things. We don't say preach and you get an easy life. We say preach, believe in the gospel and you lose things. Believe in the gospel and you get a harder life. Who would say that? Who would believe that? Well, nobody would say it or believe it unless it were true. And so the opposition you face in evangelism validates the truth of your message. This is what Paul writes in Colossians, that we fill up what's lacking in the afflictions of Christ. It's not that the death of Jesus is missing anything substantial. I mean, our, our atonement is complete through the death of Jesus. His death was perfect. He took our sins and died perfectly for us. So what's lacking in the afflictions of Christ? Well, those who would be afflicted and taking it to the world. That's what's lacking. The messenger feet are lacking. Those who would take the, world, the message to the world to a world that's not gonna believe it, that's not gonna receive it, that's gonna take the message that God came to his own and his own received him not. That message has to go to the world and has to go to the world through suffering and through difficulty for people to believe it. It's in that way that persecution validates the truth of the gospel, just like the cross. The devil turns Jesus over to the cross to defeat God and ends up being defeated by it. You're persecuted by the world for for preaching the gospel and the world thinks that persecution will 
extinguish the light. The opposite is true. It makes the light brighter. It makes it shine brighter. The truth of the gospel is that diamond light that shines brighter on the black backdrop of persecution. The more persecution it is, the more evident the gospel is true. As I mentioned, this is the opposite of the health and wealth message. This is the way is narrow. This is why Jesus says, you wanna follow him, pick up your cross. The cross is emblematic of his own persecution. You wanna follow Jesus, you will embrace it too. The student is not above his teacher. If they called the master of the house Beelzebul, if they called him to the devil, how much more will they malign those of his households? Matthew 10, 34, Jesus says, don't think I came to bring peace to the world. I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. I came to bring division. That promise still applies to us. Evangelism brings division. Some people say, I don't, I don't evangelize because it's too hard. Too hard to evangelize. People don't believe. I could get in trouble. People will think I'm dumb. It's not, people don't want to listen to it. Maybe it's not even that. People just don't want to listen to it. They don't want to listen to me tell them about Jesus and you know, they got things to do. I got things to do. I don't, it's too hard to evangelize. Listen, if it was easy, we wouldn't need you to do it. <laughs> Beyond that, if it was easy, you wouldn't have anything to say. This is not an easy message for easy people. This is an impossible message for dead people. And you're sent to the world with it and they will hate you for it because the light shines in the darkness. The darkness does not understand it. The darkness will not come to it. The darkness hates the light. This is God's design. Understand that persecution is not an obstacle to the gospel. Persecution is the path of the gospel. When Christians go to difficult places in the world to preach the gospel, the truth of that message is vindicated. It's validated. When Christians risk their, their job and then when they risk their friends for the sake of evangelism, their message is validated. Better to have a culture with persecution over a culture with superficial faith. Better to have a culture with persecution than a culture where people just love moralism and think everything's okay. Better have a culture of evangelism within a church than a culture where live and let live reigns. Because where evangelism and persecution are, there you know the cross is. And where the cross is, the favor of the Lord shines. Lord, we wanna go into the world with your gospel. We know that persecution is the means by which you've set before us for the gospel to go to the nations. Well, we also are thankful that we live in a country where persecution is not as flagrant as it is elsewhere in the world. Our lives are not at risk, our liberty is not at risk. We think of our brothers and sisters meeting on this Lord's Day around the world that are facing the loss of their houses, the jail, even the loss of their life for no other reason than they believe your gospel. We pray they would experience comfort and favor from you even on this day. But for us, Lord, in this nation, we pray that you would guard our heart from apathy, that you would guard our heart from just being content with our lives. Help us be passionate about evangelism, Lord, because we know we used to stand in opposition to you. We hear our own mocking voice call out among the scoffers. We condemn shame condemned you to shame as well. And yet, Lord, your love overcame even our stubborn hearts and brought us to faith in you. We're grateful for that. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. You have been listening to Emmanuel with Pastor Jesse Johnson. You can find more resources like this at ibcva.com. Here is a parting word from Pastor Jesse. If you have any questions about what you heard today, or if you want to learn more about what it means to follow Christ, please visit our church website, ibcva.com. If you're not a member of a local church and you live in the Washington, D.C. area, we'd love to have you worship with us here at Emmanuel. We're located in Northern Virginia, and for more information about when and where we worship, check out our church website. I hope to personally meet you this Sunday after our service. But no matter where you live, it's our hope that everyone who uses this resource is involved in their own local church. Now may God bless you this week as you seek Jesus constantly, serve the Lord faithfully, and share the gospel boldly.